Hello, and welcome to Based on a True Story, the podcast that compares your favorite Hollywood movies with history. Today, we're going to be looking at the movie All Quiet on the Western Front. I'm talking about the 2022 movie directed by Edward Berger. That's what we'll be looking at today, not the 1930 film with the same name or the 1979 made-for-TV movie. All of those, though, are based on the 1929 novel written by a German veteran of World War I, Eric Maria Remark. All Quiet on the Western Front tells the story of a 17-year-old named Paul who joins the German army in the spring of 1917 along with his friends. We follow along from their perspective as they go from being super excited about joining the war for their country and patriotism to realizing that war is not as exciting and heroic as they thought it would be. To put it lightly, war is hell. And in the movie, we see the experience from Paul's perspective as he comes face to face with many of the horrors throughout the final days of World War I. To help us separate fact from fiction in the movie, we'll get to learn from Dr. Christopher Warren. He is the Vice President of Collections and Senior Curator at the National World War I Museum and Memorial in Kansas City, Missouri. It's one of the best places in the world to learn about the First World War. So today is a little bit like the museum coming to you. <laughs> Before we bring Christopher on the line, let's set up our game. Two truths and a lie. If you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'm about to say three things. That means two of them are true. And one, well, one of them is an all-out lie. <laughs> are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one, there were multiple lines of trenches. Number two, chemical weapons were only used by the Germans during World War I. Number three, General Friedrichs did not order an offensive attack right at the end like we see in the movie. Got him? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, your challenge is to identify which one of those was the lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. All right, now it's time to connect with Dr. Christopher Warren about the historical accuracy of All Quiet on the Western Front. Before we dive into some more details of the movie, I wanted to clarify something about the story. Now, the, the movie that we're talking about is new, but the story is not. It's based on a novel from 1929, also called All Quiet on the Western Front. And in that book, it, we also see characters that we see in the movie, Paul, Albert, Kat, Jodin, and so on. So we know the characters weren't specifically made up for the movie, but do we know if the main characters were actually based on real people? Eric Maria Remark was a veteran of the First World War. Uh, he was conscripted into the German military uh, when he was 18 years old in 1917, served on the Western Front, was wounded in three different places pretty badly by um, artillery fire, and was uh, convalesced for the remainder of the war after he was injured in 1917 in a hospital in Germany. So the individuals that he's talking about are uh, not directly related to anyone he knew, but they're kind of an amalgamation of the types of individuals he served with. And what I really think he's trying to uh, go for is uh, to c give you kind of an, an overview of the relationships that soldiers had really on all sides uh, during the war, experiences the horrific nature of trench warfare and uh, what it was like uh, on the Western Front. Okay, so to feed that back, make sure I'm understanding, it's basically trying to kind of get a sense for what it was like, but not like, so the story that we see in the movie isn't necessarily going to be, this is exactly what happened to this one person throughout the war. It's more just the overall experience of somebody who lived through it. Right. Yeah. How, you know, you, as I'm sure we'll talk about in Germany, especially how you signed up with your friends to go serve you, so you served in the same uh, regiment battalion uh, unit, how you had the old hand sergeant who was trying to teach the new recruits how to survive on the Western front and how many, uh, many soldiers experienced not only, you know, danger to themselves, but seeing their friends uh, injured and killed. Well, at the beginning of the movie, there is a, a very moving sequence. We see a, a German soldier named Heinrich. He follows orders to climb to the top of the trenches and, and attack the enemy. We don't see exactly what happens to him, but there's the title of the movie. And then afterwards, we can see just stacks of coffins being buried, uh, three high, dozens at a time in these huge uh, graves. Before they're buried, though, the soldiers are stripped of their clothes. 
And then the clothes, the movie follows the clothes. They're bundled up, sent back to where we see the uniforms being washed, mended, and then reissued to new recruits. And that's how we're introduced to the main character, Paul. And he gets his new uniform, the one that Heinrich used to wear. Did they really reuse military uniforms in World War I like we see in the movie? Uh, so I'm going to give you the historian's answer uh, some. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was certainly certainly did use reuse uniforms uh, that they um, took off wounded soldiers where they would go back receive treatment at a field hospital and farther back they would remove their clothing and if it wasn't too damaged and reusable they would you know, clean them and mend them and reissue those from the wounded soldiers. It's less likely. It, certainly, I wouldn't say it never happened, but it's less likely they used uniforms from soldiers who were killed simply because of, of uh, practicality. Those soldiers, especially on the Western Front. 60% of them died from artillery fire, which would create, of course, destructive, uh, was so destructive that it not only uh, mangled these men and, and you know, obliterated them in some cases, it had some serious uh, damage on the uniforms as well. In addition, uh, especially on the Western Front again, some of these uniforms from the dead could have had a residue of gas, um, mustard gas still kind of embedded in them. It had been much more difficult to reuse those uniforms. So I'm not, I'm not going to say it never happened. But it was, it's less likely that uniforms from the dead were used, but certainly uniforms from the wounded that could be reused, uh, were, they did so. That makes sense, especially with the artillery, because I think when we see it in the in the movie, they're 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 mending things, but they're mending little holes, like you know, you're assuming bullet holes and little things like that. And I didn't even think about the. But it is artillery. true, especially by 1917, 1918 in Germany. You know, they're they're because of the uh, the British blockade, they're running out of raw materials and food throughout Germany. So they were doing everything they possibly could to uh, use different types of materials or, or save and, and recycle these things. For instance, for uh, the machine gun belt, the belt that actually held the bullets were fed into machine guns. They went from using uh, cotton um, to using paper, uh, which was to, to, because they were running out of cotton, which was uh, pretty ingenious. But uh, of course, when, it, when the paper got wet, it oftentimes didn't work with machine guns. Hmm. He, you mentioned this earlier, and I wanted to ask you about it, because in the movie, we do see Paul and his friends excited to sign up for service in the spring of 1917. Uh, Paul's so excited, he fakes his father's signature to get in because he's too young to get in on his own. And then we see there's a principal at the school he's congratulating all the recruits on becoming, as, as the movie puts it, the Iron Youth of Germany. And it says that they're going to go to the front lines where we'll pierce the enemy, and you will, in a few short weeks, finally march on Paris, and everybody just cheers wildly at this. The impression that I got from this was there just a lot of pride and patriotism in the German youth wanting to fight for their country. Even years into the war in 1917, they're years into the war at this point. And of course, we'll get to what happens when they find out what war is really like. But that sense of excitement that we see for Paul and his friends, is that a good depiction of what it was like for new recruits joining the German military in 1917? Yes, um, you would think after three years of war, hundreds of thousands being killed, that there wouldn't be as much enthusiasm in Germany, but there was, mm -hmm. as opposed to France and England and Britain, uh, because Germany, of course, their government controlled the messaging that was coming out. There was no independent press at the time, especially after three years of war. They were telling uh, reporters in the press exactly what to say, how to betray the war, and, and they were doing this in the best light they could, including getting s schoolmasters and public speakers and cinema and everything you could think of still portraying that uh, Germany was on uh, the brink of victory. They would be in uh, Paris in just a few months, uh, which, of course, they had said that in 1914, they'd be in Paris and be home by Christmas. <laughs> um, so, yes, it's ab absolutely a, a correct depiction. You know, the, the German people, of course, were hearing rumors and they had some you know, information coming through the grapevine that maybe everything wasn't as rosy as the government was portraying. But when you have no independent press, when you have no way of getting a contrary message into your country, what is actually going on and how many men are being killed and the horrific nature of combat and what things are, how things are going. This, this type of propaganda, this type of enthusiasm was definitely still there in 1917. It would start changing, of course, in 1918, but I think it's a very accurate portrayal. That, that's interesting. You mentioned that, that they were saying that even in, you know, 1914, that, oh, we're going to be in Paris soon. And, you know, a few years later, it still hasn't happened, uh, but they it's still using the same lines that, you know, we're, we're almost right. there. We're almost there. Right. I should also add that a lot of depictions of the war, uh, or when we look back on it, we think by, you know, some historians have argued by 1917, even late 1916, the German high command knew they were going to lose the war. And that's not really true. 
Germany had some successes on the battlefield. Um, they still were, of course, uh, all their, their the Western Front was still controlling major portions of France. They weren't even fighting on their home soil. Um, and as you'll see in 1918, the German military, the German high command, truly believed that they still could have won this war. And you know, I think it's possible that some things had went differently. So it wasn't complete propaganda. They weren't just lying to the German people, uh, making up uh, stories when they knew it wasn't going to happen. I'm confident they truly believed, and it, it was true, that Germany was still in a good shape to win the war in 1917, at least, and early 1918, the spring of 1918. They had a very successful offensive campaign that eventually gets bogged down for lots of different reasons. Uh, but it was not a fait accompli at this point, in 1917 especially, that Germany was definitely going to lose this war. You, you mentioned this earlier, so maybe you've already kind of answered my next question, but when we do see Paul and his friends arrive at the Western Front, their movie mentions they're part of the 78th Reserve Infantry Regiment in Northern France, but there's not a lot of context around what's going on here. And earlier you're talking about, you know, the control of information. And I wasn't sure since the movie is kind of focusing on Paul and the small group of soldiers around him, maybe that's why we don't get a bigger context of what's going on in the war. But it seems like when... Paul and these new recruits are joining the Western Front. They're basically being thrown into this, the middle of this conflict without really knowing the overall context. Is that really what it was like for the new recruits then? Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, this was not unique to the German military either. Training troops, especially conscripted troops, you're training them to do a specific job in a specific place and not worry about the overall tactics or strategy or political environment uh, that they're moving into. You want them to be focused. You want them to be trained and to do uh, what they've been trained to do. So, but but again, it goes back to Germany controlling um, the communication and the messaging that's coming out. What these troops are being uh, exposed to, even in uh, you know, in, in the French and the, and the British Army and the Americans when they finally get involved, soldiers are producing uh, their own trench newspapers talking about things, um, hmm. scuttle scuttlebutt and uh, rumors, things like that. Uh, the German newspapers that the soldiers producing are, are much more tightly controlled. You know, the, the American newspapers and the French newspapers and the British newspapers, they were controlled by censors as well. So they couldn't see too many things that would give away intelligence or positioning or anything like that, of course. Um, but the German ones were much more controlled. So they were even in their own internal uh, trench newspapers and, and communication. They weren't hearing um, what's going on anywhere else. The only thing they're hearing is Germany is progressing. They're doing well. Uh, everything is going like it should be going that's what they're hearing officially but you know they as you see in the movie and, and read in the book definitely Paul and the man he served with you know it doesn't matter what they're hearing for from german propaganda they have a better understanding of at least their sector of war what's truly going on there so can you share a little bit of kind of overall context and since we can know more now what were they walking into on the western front in 1917 so in order to understand what they're walking into in 1917, you have to understand 1916. 1916, you have uh, Verdun and the Somme. These were uh, big German offensives, and British offensive um, was devastating to the Brits, the French, and the Germans. So they lost hundreds of thousands of men in this. After these two massive battles, the main battles in 1917, the Germans uh, they fall back to what they what's been referred to as the Hindenburg Line. It's just kind of a, a defensive fortification where they uh, reduce their footprint on the, the French countryside on the battlefield so they have shorter lines of communication and kind of consolidate their troops and go into a real defensive posture. Uh, so for 1917, the Germans really aren't on the front but attacking. They're in the trenches being very defensive. The French were so devastated in 1917, they weren't um, capable of mounting much of an offensive operation either. They had other issues like mutiny that occurred as well. So they were having issues. So the British really took over in 1917 as the main offensive force. Um, and they... They fought a series of uh, three battles. The French originally, uh, they fight the Nivelle Offensive. So they attack uh, into the German lines, try to, and then uh, the British uh, attack in Flanders, uh, up in Belgium as well. Uh, and then there was a couple other battles. So uh, the Allies are on the front, but they're attacking the Germans who have kind of retreated to this uh, interior lines. So the, the, the story, the movie and the book is very realistic in terms of what the German soldiers are, are experiencing on the front line. They're being attacked constantly in, in, uh, in different sectors, of course, in 1917. They're having to deal with being on the defensive, not feel like they're progressing anywhere. Uh, and they're just trying to, survive. as you see in the movie, they're just trying to survive, you know, wave after wave of attack and then counterattacking by the Germans to try to push the French and the British back to 
Okay, yeah, that was something I was going to ask about because I noticed you know, throughout the movie, it, it just seemed, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of offensive from the German side. Most of what we see just seems like Paul's in the trenches and the Germans are just trying to survive. You know, at night there's artillery barrages, the soldiers hide in the bunkers, and then during the day they're collecting their dead comrades, you know, the bodies and the dog tags. And uh, there's right. even a line of dialogue when Paul first meets Kaczynski that he just says, you know, no rest for the wicked. It's the same every day. So would that that would sounds like it's a pretty accurate uh, depiction of what trench for, warfare was like at that right. time. Right, yeah, and it's very uh, accurate in terms of you wouldn't have seen much fighting during the day out of the trenches because obviously you're easier to pick out if you're attacking during daylight. So a lot of those attacks came either early in the morning at dusk or, or uh, late at night, or excuse me, early morning at dawn or late at night at dusk, or um, nighttime uh, assaults. So that's very accurate in terms of what they were doing during the day. Um, yeah, like I said, the Germans were not, at least on the Western Front, we're not in attack mode too much in 1917. Uh, sporadic, uh, small-scale um, skirmishes, and they were just trying to survive uh, the, the the onslaught of the British and the French. They also knew, of course, the German High Command that in April 1917, the, the Americans, uh, of course, were coming into the war. Um, now, of course, the, the United States wouldn't have much of a role in terms of uh, manpower on the front for uh, many months, uh, and that didn't do too much in 1917. But they knew this onslaught hundreds of thousands if not millions of americans were on their way uh, so they they were pretty smart in terms of pulling back um setting up a, a more um, realistic defensive uh, line of battle uh, consolidating their troops uh, shortening their lines of communication all those things you have to do if you're going to be on the defensive. so at that point did they start to change some of the information that going out like the the impression that they were going to be in Paris did they, it, it they sounds like they oh, no. at least high command they started to realize that that's not realistic <laughs> right um well you know their defensive was an anticipation of, of launching a new and massive offensive okay so that's what the Germans are um, they're kind of consulting all their troops they're getting uh, new recruits coming in all the time of course but of course as we uh, as we get in 1917 these troops are having you know uh, maybe we'll talk about this in, in a little bit just a minimal amount of training. So they're getting these raw recruits that don't have, uh, don't have much idea what they're supposed to be doing or how to do it. Um, but, you know, they're not, the German High Command is not um, driving back to the Sinnenberg line thinking, you know, the war is over. We're uh, trying to set ourselves up for, for an armistice. Uh, they're still uh, anticipating in 1918 going back in the front, but attacking. Uh, and, and finally, you know, they have a plan to not to uh, knock the British, separate the French and the British from each other, the two armies knock the British out of the war as quickly as possible uh, to then concentrate on the French. And this is all before the Americans can, can really get organized. And they think it'll take a, a, you know, a year, 18 months for the Americans to actually make any kind of contribution. Uh, of course, the Americans do it much quicker than the Germans anticipate. But that, that's their idea. They want to consolidate so they can then reform and reattack in the spring of 1918. Okay. Okay. You, you mentioned the, the training there and that brings up a great point of something else that we don't see, you know, I mentioned we don't really see many offensive, but we don't see training. Like, uh, Paul and his friends are so excited to be recruits and they, you know, put on their uniform, mentioned that, and there's really no basic training or training that we see. Does that mean that they pretty much were just shipped to the front without any training at all? Yeah. So, you know, and starting in 1914, the training for drafted or conscripted troops is really as the years go on, it's less and less and less. They don't just don't have the, the manpower. They don't have the experienced sergeants as the years go on as well, because they're all being sent to the front after a while because they're needed out there. And so by 1917, 1918, the conscripted German troops are getting, you know, maybe a couple weeks wow. um, of basic rudimentary training. Wow. Uh, but you, there's a great portrayal towards the end of the movie, a young German soldier who Paul kind of becomes you know, they don't show too much of a, a little bit of a mentor towards this young German soldier. He's the one that actually takes the um identification desk off Paul's mm-hmm. body. And you can see that they, they do a good job of portraying this kid and having no, being completely close, having no idea what he's supposed to do. So that's a pretty realistic portrayal of what the average German recruit by late 1917, early 1918, what they're uh, looking like. Now the Germans still have, you know, formidable men left in their army. They still have um, good experienced troops left. So it's not all like this, but certainly when you're grabbing from the, you know, the youngest portion of your society and giving them minimal training, it's, it's not looking good. For your, for your chances. I want to change gears for a minute because in the movie, uh, we see the trenches themselves. And I wanted to ask about those because a, that's a big part of uh, the warfare as, as well. In the, the German trenches, we see visuals of, you know, they look like they're made of wood. They look deep enough for everyone to stand up and still have some space above them. So 
the movie doesn't, I don't remember it mentioning specifics of how tall it was. I'm guessing maybe, you know, eight feet or two and a half meters right. roughly. Uh, and then it rains and we see it, the bottom just fills up. There's even some points where you, it almost looks like up to their knees at some points. And right after Paul arrives, one, one part, you know, they're just picking up water with their helmet and just kind of bailing it out. How well did the movie do depicting what the trenches themselves were like? It did a great job. You know, trenches were, you know, on average, like eight feet tall so that you could walk, you know, the average man or even a, a tall man could walk and have their head covered over the top. You would step up to a firing line and you could see that in the movie to fire over the, the top of the trench. You know, these trenches were not uniform, certainly. In fact, the Germans, they built the best trenches. Hmm. Um, they were, you know, in some places they, they were reinforced with concrete. They had bunkers they could escape to. You didn't really see that in, in the movie itself. Uh, the reason that was is because the Germans, of course, when they attack into France in 1914, and it turns into this kind of stalemate trench warfare, they have no no intention of moving back to Germany. They're they're going to stay on on French soil. So they build a very robust and reinforced, and very um, in in some places when they can, um, very kind of advanced trench line. Whereas the French and the and the British, their trenches are much more ordinary. They're usually mud, maybe with some wood. Uh, that's about it. They do have some dugouts, but not reinforced with concrete in general or anything like that. Because the French and the British, of course, they have to get out of the trenches and push the Germans back to Germany, where the Germans don't have to. They can stay exactly where they are because they're in French territory. So they take the time to really make these uh, much more defensible because it's uh, much more habitable in many ways, too. They have them. Some of them, they have electricity, telephone, telegraph wire, straw, uh, barracks, those types of things. Uh, so, But it does, you know, it, it's no matter how well they made them, Flooding was always a problem, especially up in Flanders, because you're uh, not very far. Those trenches were not very far above the water mm -hmm. table. Uh, so as soon as you duck down, it was wet and moist, and, and they would fill up with rain. Uh, and you, on all sides, you read stories about soldiers suffering in these trenches that are always slick with mud, filled, you know, filled with lice, rats everywhere. And of course, the issue that comes with when you're constantly wet like that, one of the main diseases that, that occurred because of this was what they call trench fever that was contracted through or, or passed through uh, lice. Hmm. And it would give you this trench fever would be debilitating you have fevers. You would get lethargic. You have to be pulled off the line. And you could also have a uh, trench foot was also a big problem too. Your feet were constantly wet. They're always submerged in water at times. You couldn't get them dry. Uh, and that basically is where the skin tip just rot off your feet after a while. So they took great, they, they tried to do as best they could in terms of making men change their socks, using foot powder, trying to keep their feet dry. But there, with the rain and the flooding and everything in the trenches, it was very difficult. So they did a great job. Um, there was, there's one quote from, a, I think it's a British soldier who said, at least up in Flanders, there was the, the mud was anywhere from pure water to kind of dough where you ready to put in an oven to bake. So just, you know, it was a pretty horrific conditions, no matter how well they made the trenches. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, that's, you're then obviously fighting the enemy on the other side, but you're also fighting against the elements. Did they normally take the soldiers out of the trenches and kind of let them uh, to recover? Or was it only when they started to show signs of sickness that, okay, now you're going to a, a medical facility or was there kind of a, to a common changing out? So yeah, they absolutely took them out of the trenches. Um, there is this kind of misunderstood concept and, and the movie kind of portrays that in a way where these soldiers, whether they be the Germans or the, uh, the Allied countries, were put in the trenches and never pulled out. They lived there forever. That's not really the case. You know, soldiers, there was different levels of trenches. There's a frontline trench. There are reserve trenches. There's communication trenches. On average, and things were always dependent on the situation, soldiers would be kind of on the frontline trench maybe a couple weeks at most. Then they'd be pulled back to a reserve trench. Then they could be pulled farther back. And they were always rotating these units in and out. So it's not like these soldiers were with, you know, a couple of specific exceptions. Most of the soldiers would be rotated through pretty frequently. It doesn't make the conditions any, any better, but they at least knew that if they could survive, you know, the, the maximum amount of time they could be up there is, is two weeks on average. Like I said, it's always situation dependent. And there are uh, instances, there was um, some Portuguese troops that were put out on the line uh, in the trenches for months because wow. they didn't have any, um, uh, they didn't have any soldiers to back them up or to pull them out and replace them with. So that certainly happened when they were there for a long time. But on average, you know, they're rotating these soldiers through as best they can. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, knowing that that's something that uh, they're going to have to deal with. It sounds like, especially on the German side, you know, they 
they planned on the trenches a lot more so, so it seemed, would make sense that they would have some sort of a system there. Absolutely. A- according to the movie, there's a date, uh, November 7th, 1918, and we're at the Supreme Army Command, and there's a mention of over 40,000 soldiers being killed in the last few weeks. Would the movie be right to suggest that the losses on the German side were that significant near the end of the war? Absolutely. Uh, In fact, on the final day of the war on November 11th, between the time that they sign the armistice, which is, you know, early, I think it's between 5 and 6 a.m. And when it goes into effect on 11 a.m., almost 3,000 men are killed in that short six hour, five, six hour period. So they're uh, all side, it's not just the German side, they're fighting right up until November 11th. And there's a lot of reasons they did this. They weren't sure the Germans were going to sign the the the, the um, armistice agreement. They wanted to position themselves, these uh, military units on all sides. They wanted to position themselves as best they could if they had to go back to fighting. But also there was a lot of um, you know officers who were in charge who took it upon themselves to kind of grab that last piece of glory to tell people back home that they you know, were in the final battle of the war, that kind of thing. So there was um, kind of an uproar, at least in the United States after the war. People, when they realized how many men were killed in the final day mm. of the war, there was even congressional investigations that looked into General Pershing's commander of the American Expeditionary Forces, um, his uh, conduct in terms of um, pushing his troops until November 11th. Nothing ever came out of the investigations. No one was ever found culpable. But it was certainly very tragic that, you know, it, and I should say the armistice was not a surprise. It had been kind of in the works. People knew about this. Uh, commanders knew about this. In general, towards the end of the war, there were places where uh, opposing forces would kind of pull back and kind of have a live and let live attitude. They knew the war was coming to an end. Mm. Uh, No more frontal attacks. Just stay where you are. Don't cause any problems and wait this thing out. But there was, unfortunately, too many instances where commanders on on, on all sides were still trying to, you know, advance and um, right up to the end. Was that the impression I got from the movie when they mentioned that, you know, amount of people? The impression I got was that was kind of the final straw as to, you know, why they were wanting peace in the end was it just because they were exhausted just didn't have the enough soldiers was would that be the real reason yeah, well you know the, the germans um it's kind of complicated in terms of first you have to first first thing you have to start with is their people are starving in germany now. The, the blockade had been done so well by the, the the british navy that families are writing to the troops in the front saying we have no food we have no food to send you can you send us food going back so you mentioned that. mentioned that in the movie. They send some food and then it's like, hey, do you have any money? I um cat's wife, right. I think it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Inflation got it out of control. They people can't buy food. They're starving with the blockade. The and the Germans are running out of they're, they're not running out of men, but the men they're having to conscript are getting younger and younger with less training. So they're much less effective. And also the Germans know that I think it says in the movie, uh, I think the uh, uh the politician at the end there, he's he says quite right, there's two hundred and fifty thousand Americans that are landing a in France every day. So they know there's this huge onslaught that they could not possibly overcome. Uh, and the Americans in 1919 showed their mettle to be an effective fighting unit, defeating uh, very experienced German units. So it's kind of it's, it's like all warfare, it's a combination of things. The political will was gone. The people were demanding an end to the war. The German people were starving. Uh, the Kaiser had abdicated at that point. Most of the Military commanders knew the writing was on the wall. It, it, you know, had been for months that there was no way for them to achieve anything. So it was that combination that really ended the war on the German side. Okay. Okay. Well, th- that leads right into my next question. Something we see in the movie. Um, it's actually a, a plot point early on in the movie, but then it kind of comes back at the end. That's when uh, we see Paul and Cat going to steal a, a goose to eat from a local farm, and you just get the impression you know they're they're starving. They they want food. So they're okay with putting their lives at risk. There's a, you know, French farmers trying to shoot them as they're just stealing the bird. Right. Um, and, and there, there's even, there is an, another part where we see, uh, the character France going off with, uh, some women have, as they walk by at first, I thought he deserted them, but then he comes back later that night. The impression I got there was, yeah, the German soldiers are starving. The officers don't really seem to be keeping a close eye on the men that they can almost leave and then come back. Was it common for the German soldiers at that point to loot local farms or just leave like we see in the movie? Sure. Well, looting, definitely. I mean, that took part from the beginning of the war to the end of the yeah. war in a way that they could supplement their food. And of course, you know, fresh food like a goose is always going to be better than military ship food. But you can see it was absolutely, absolutely accurate that the 
1978, 19, the German army is running out of food as well. So you can imagine what people back in Germany are going through. If the German government can't feed the troops that are fighting, they certainly don't have, you know, enough food for the, the civilian population. Uh, going off and trying to find anything from food to entertainment, I guess we could say, or uh, anything of that sort was common. You know, it was common in, in all militaries back during World War II, all the, all the combatants. Um, the soldiers many times are, you know, they, they kind of push what they can get away with. For a soldier to leave that lab to go, to go off for however long he was gone for the entire day or day, day and night uh, with some French women, you know, that's an indication I think he's trying to portray that, which is true by late 1917, 1918, the German officers, of course, just like the, the enlisted guys, the quality of officers, the training, those officers are getting a very, are very, this very lax. People are, you know, the troops as well, they're, they're exhausted by the war. They're not caring as much, you know, they're just trying to survive and do whatever they can so that. Discipline and morale is kind of is going down in the German military in 1918, especially. So that you, soldiers are able to get away with a lot of things that it would be much more difficult to do. And the punishments potentially were much harsher if you had deserted your post for a day um, or left to get food at some farm. Yeah, yeah, it's a pr- definitely impression I got. I didn't even think about, you know, we're talking about the recruits not having much, as much training, but uh, it's only going to be a matter of time before that filters to the officers as well. And they're just not going to be as experience and be able to hold the, the soldiers accountable for things. Well, and another reason is because the officers, of course, in the first few years of the war are more, you know, trained German officers who had, had been in the military for years. And by the time you get to 1918, a lot of these officers have zero military training. They're just put in because they're maybe positioned in their, in their town or village and they know someone. Uh, so their experiences with military life and discipline are much different officers previous you mentioned the gas earlier a little bit when we were talking about the uniforms and there's a scene in the movie where we see paul and a team of other soldiers they're sent to look out for 60 new recruits that were a day late to show up when they do find them they're all dead cat mentioned something about how they took off their gas masks too early it tells me they probably died not because they didn't have the means to withstand the chemical weapons, but they were just not trained properly on how to use their masks. Can you give a little more historical context around the effectiveness of gas and chemical weapons in the war? Sure. Um, you know, when people think about World War I, they usually think about one of two things, trenches and gas warfare. And it is true, this, is, this, was, this was the first, this was not the first use of, of chemical weapons in warfare, but this, this was the first mass use of chemical weapons. So gas warfare, um, when it was first used, was very uh, effective. They used everything from tear gas to chlorine gas to phosgene, and then, of course, mustard gas, which most people probably have you know, heard something about. Um, incredibly effective initially, but it, chemical weapons are, are, are a type of weapon that you can develop countermeasures for to protect you from them. Unlike artillery shells or bullets, uh, there is ways to survive a gas attack, and that's through use of gas masks, of course. So as soon as uh, it, this is one of those technological advancements that goes kind of hand in hand during the war. As soon as chemical weapons are used by the Germans and then by everybody on all sides, including the Americans, when they get there, the, the race to develop better and better gas masks is on. The original gas masks, of course, were soldiers being told to urinate on their handkerchiefs because the urea would, would help protect them in, in the urine, would, uh, protect them from chlorine. <laughs> but eventually, of course, that gets much, much more sophisticated. <laughs> I'd hope so. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I, well, the alternative, alternative I, I'm sure, was better um, to have the handkerchief than the chlorine gas. That's true. Uh, so as more and more deadly gases are used, as the um, the ways in which they're used become more advanced and more tactically useful, the defenses are, are, st- are keeping up at the same time. So a little over a million, maybe like 1.2 million casualties occur during the war because of gas, but only 90,000 of those or so are actually deaths. So it's a very small percentage are killed from gas, from chemical weapons. Uh, what gas becomes is, it's really um, a hindrance. They, they use it to reduce combat effectiveness. If it kills some soldiers, that's great uh, for uh, the belligerent side, but it's to suppress uh, enemy defenses. So if you're shelled with gas, with uh, mustard gas or chlorine or phosgene or whatever, you're having to put these gas masks on, they're difficult to see out of, it's hard to breathe. It, it reduces your combat effectiveness substantially. Uh, so that's what they kind of, what, that's what they're really used for. Uh, large artillery barrages that usually include gas. And it's to suppress those defenses in the trenches and everywhere else uh, so they can't uh, immediately pop up after the artillery is, is completed and, and their machine guns in their firing positions. And it's also, of course, a psychological weapon. 
there's numerous accounts of soldiers on all sides. A lot of them did, eventually didn't really think they were going to be killed by uh, chemical weapons, but the harassment, the dread of, of, of hearing gas, 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 or seeing a, a green mist of chlorine coming across the trenches really was effective psychologically. Probably the worst of, of all the chemical weapons was mustard gas. It was probably the most effective. Because the other ones you had to inhale, actually. If you, wore, if you had your gas mask on and you were using it properly, you were, you were pretty much safe from being injured. But mustard gas, not only could you inhale it, uh, it was a very, um, uh, like an oily substance that when it got on your skin, it burned. Mm. Uh, it made huge uh, blisters on your skin. So not only did you have to get your gas mask on, you had to be completely covered up. And uh, unlike other gases, it would stick around. It was heavier than air, so it would float down into the bottom of shell holes and trenches stay there. It could, la- it could be still be uh, potent a few days, a few weeks after it was launched. So it was a, a real uh, harasser and dangerous for the troops themselves. Wow. I can only imagine then in, in the trenches too, because we were talking about, you know, just the challenges with just water, but having that added on top of that is, it's just uh, another level. Well, we talked about this a little bit uh, here and there earlier uh, with the armistice, but in the movie we see, there's a character we haven't really talked about much, um, Daniel Brühl's character, Erzberger, and he's part of a, a German coalition that we see arriving in France on November 8th, 1918. Uh, they're meeting with the French to try to find peace, but the French, according to the movie, they're just not up for any negotiation. They give their demands, basically give the Germans 72 hours to take it or leave it. And the fighting is going to continue during those 72 hours. Uh, according to the movie, things seem to be pre- pretty desperate. Uh, he does mention, like you, like you talked about earlier, you know, the 250,000 Americans landing in Europe. But then uh, again, as you mentioned, the Kaiser abdicates, we hear that in the movie and Hindenburg urges the coalition to sign. So they do. And then the French say the war is going to end six hours later, the 11th hour, the 11th day of the 11th month. Is that an accurate way of depicting how the armistice was actually signed? Yes, yeah, actually it is. Um, they, it was a um, rendezvous in, uh, in a forest and train cars accurately predicted for Ned Bosch was there. In the history, he was only there twice, which I think was kind of portrayed in the movie at the very beginning to ask the Germans what they wanted and at the very end of the negotiations to tell them to sign. Fine. <laughs> so there was, yeah, and there was, this is where, so the German politicians, the Social Democratic Party at that point had, had uh, taken over de facto control of the German government. So you see that in the politicians that are there, but then you also see the individual who's the military commander as well, the military representative. He's uh, less willing to sign yeah. these very uh, draconian, really it's surrender terms. They're not called that, but uh, it's what it is. And the politicians, they know what's going on at home. They know that this war is over. Uh, mil- many of the military commanders want to keep fighting because, again, the Germans are still in France. It's not like the, the uh, Allied armies have pushed them back to Berlin like in World War II and have you know, completely devastated the entire German uh, country and, and the German military. They're wanting to, to keep fighting, but the politicians wisely recognize that this war is over and there's a way we can win it. So the, the armistice is signed in Foch's uh, train car. This is the same train car that Hitler demands or has uh, the French leadership sign terms of surrender in World War II, an early part of the war. Uh, so I'm sure that was not a coincidence. Not a coincidence. Yeah. So it was it was actively accurately portrayed, and they even portray. You you can see in the movie between the politic the German politician who's there and the German military representative, you can see the beginnings of kind of that stab in the back myth that occurs in Germany shortly after the war war. The military, who are allowed to march back into these German towns, uh, they, the commanders of the military, they start betraying that they were not defeated on the battlefield, that it was the Social Democratic Party or the politi- politicians who turned their back on Germany, on the German military. They were the ones that stabbed them in the back. This, of course, would be used as propaganda for the National Socialist Party and Hitler. Um, uh, he turns into even more nefarious needs, uh, blaming uh, Jewish people and that sort um, but yeah it, it was it, i think i think that portion of it was very nicely done by the filmmaker too even if you don't know the total history if you know a little bit more there's a lot of nuance in those scenes of the, of the, the rail car hmm. you, you mentioned you mentioned we don't see this of course at all in the movie with, with uh hitler there in you know world war ii and and having uh those terms signed for the surrender of, of france in world war ii would it be correct then to assume that this armistice played a big part in World War II even happening? Oh, of course, yes. World War II is really just a continuation of World War One. 
after a few years. You know, I, I was watching this with um, some friends and they were asking this movie with some friends. They're asking me why, because we know the history. We know that the, really the draconian punishment put on Germany for World War I creates the cultural, social, and political conditions for eventually the rise of the Nazi party in World War II, right? We know that history. And my friends asked me, why did the French insist and the British insist on such no negotiation, such draconian terms? I said, well, look, you know, they, they had been invaded, the French. Uh, they had lost millions of men. A generation had been wiped out. They didn't know what was going to happen. They just knew they wanted to mete out punishment on a, a historic enemy who had, who had, again, defeated the French military in the Franco-Prussian War in the 1870s. So this was a long-running threat from Germany to the French people. So they were just trying to ensure that Germany would never be a military power again, so that France would never have to, you know, make this sacrifice in the future. So, uh, yeah, it, it, you know, there's been a lot of there's there's literature galore people can read about it, how the links, how the signing the armistice and the Treaty of Versailles, uh, how that created the conditions in Germany for, um, you know, the destruction of their economy, uh, looking for a strong man to come and lead them out of poverty, rebuild the military, German nationalism, et cetera, et cetera. So absolutely, it's not so much. I always uh, argue that World War One created the conditions. It's that it was just an armistice, and looking back on it, it's almost predictable that something like that would have happened, or that another conflict would have broken out. It, it's fascinating. That you, you know, you mentioned that they they were trying to make sure that Germany wouldn't be a military power again, and the exact opposite. I mean, again, we right. know from history, you know. They couldn't have predicted exactly what right. happened, I'm sure. But something else that you kind of um, touched on earlier that we see at the very end of the movie is when we see the German general, uh, Friedrich, he refuses to lay down arms in those six hours between the armistice being signed and the ceasefire going into effect. He orders this uh, attack on the French, which they do. And this is when we see Paul uh, being a part of that attack. He asks what time it is, and it's 1045, so, you know, 15 minutes before the fighting just comes so close to 11 a.m. that we see Paul being dealt a fatal bayonet blow just what seems like seconds before the ceasefire is sounded. Everyone stops fighting. He's still alive when he stumbles upstairs from the bunker he was in fighting where he got stabbed and, and then he's in the sunlight before he dies. Was the movie be correct to show this literal, literal last minute, last second fighting that we see happening in the movie being ordered by General Friedrichs? Uh, so, well, first of all, he's not a real character. Okay. Um, and he's not actually even in the original novel. Oh, okay. Okay. So um, it's, it's true that that units on all sides were fighting right up into the last minute. Um, lots of units have kind of, like I said, pulled back and decided they weren't going to attack each other. But there were some that kept fighting. They had, they had commanders that were trying to position their units, like I said, grab some glory at the end, that type of thing. So that absolutely happened. To my knowledge, th there wasn't any German or any other offenses that occurred that were supposed to start within that close to the end of the war, 15 minutes. I think that's a little bit of mm. uh, dramatic interjection. So that's a little bit, um, probably not quite as accurate, but, but certainly they were fighting right up in certain segments, right up to the last minute there. And, uh, you know, I didn't, as a historian, that was a little bit, you know, ahistorical, but I didn't have a problem with it because I, I understood what, the filmmaker was trying to do in terms of you notice that uh, when the commander says we're going to keep fighting, there's some German soldiers who protest and they mm -hmm. drag them off and they shoot them um, against the building. Paul doesn't even react. He, you know, he's being portrayed as he's so worn down. He doesn't care. It doesn't even influence him whether he lives or dies at that point. So he's not mad, sad, anything that, that despair and desperation uh, and just his soul has been crushed to that. So I understand why they were trying to do that, because that was absolutely mm. what soldiers on all sides, how they felt uh, by the end of the war. Wow. Wow. Well, if we were to take a look at the movie kind of overall, how well do you think it did just transporting us back to the, the sights and the sounds? We talked a little bit about the trenches, but just kind of overall, did it do a good job taking us back in time to World War One? I? I think so. Um, I, you know, as a historian, you can quibble with little pieces <laughs> here and there, but it's not a documentary. Right. And I think it portrays very uh, honestly uh, the conditions the men had to live through. Like I said before, you know, they weren't necessarily in those trenches for months and months and months at a time. Uh, but that doesn't mean that when they were in there, the conditions and the, the constant fear of artillery fire and gas and disease and rats and uh, oppressive mud 
um, what these men went through, I think, was portrayed excellently by the filmmaker. I think I think Erica Marie and Remark would would be pleased with with the portrayal of his book in this movie, even though it didn't everything didn't match up exactly like the book. So I think it gave a really good overview of what and what you know what's great what not great but what is so meaningful in this movie as well as the book. Why it's been so universal is because this is not just a German story. You could put a uniform on pole of any of the belligerents. And many of them are going through these same things. So it's not a story about right and wrong. It's not making any judgments. It's just showing the experiences of these men and what it did to them at the, you know, the young age of 18, like the wall was, you know, how, how these men dealt with that or, or didn't deal with it. Wow. Yeah. W- was there anything in the movie as you were watching it that stood out to you as um, just not being a good depiction, not being accurate? Yeah, like I said, I could quibble over a few little things here and there, but I'm not going to. The only thing that kind of struck me as a little bit odd is you see when Paul and his German comrades are in the French trench at the very end after he gets stabbed um, and the war ends. Everybody is kind of, the war's over. And then you see Germans and, and Frenchmen who three seconds ago had been trying to kill each other just walking right past each other with no looks on their faces, anything like that. That's kind of inaccurate because you wouldn't have really had in most cases Germans in a French trench right at the end of the war or vice versa. And you certainly, if that had happened, I doubt if they would have just said, all right, we're done. (laughs) We're just going to walk, walk by each other and not even, you know, have any interaction whatsoever. Um, So that, you know, but that's, I, that's quibbling. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like you were saying, I mean, the offensive, not necessarily happening 15 minutes. I mean, you kind of back yourself into a corner, how, you know, when, when you have that sort of thing. Happening. Sure. You have an idea, so, yeah. yeah. But you know, <laughs> other than that, I thought it was, it was, a, it was an excellent movie. It certainly did not sugarcoat or uh, warfare. It did not make it look, uh, it did not, was not glorified or make it look as anything other than warfare is uh, brutality on the highest right. level and horrific. Well, thank you so much for coming on to chat about all quiet on the Western front. Can you share a bit of information about the national world war one museum and memorial and where someone listening can learn more or even plan their own visit? Sure. Uh, well, so we're, we are the National World War I Museum and Memorial. Uh, we were designated by Congress in 2004 as the nation's official World War I Museum in the United States. Um, please go to our website, uh, thewarwar.org, and you can get all kinds of information on we're in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, we've been collecting uh, artifacts since 1920. Uh, so what's wow. unique about our museum, maybe one of the most unique in the world, is that we collect uh, from all the belligerent nations, not just the United States, of course, not just the Allies. We have an extensive collection, over 300,000 items. Um, we have all kinds of exhibits going on. We just opened one called Captured that talks about uh, the experiences of prisoners of war in World War One. We have digital exhibits online, so please go to our website again, uh, theworldwar.org. And yeah, and you can you can read all about our history and how we came to be. Um, just really quickly, um, we ha- like I said, we've been collecting since 1920, and actually our museum or its predecessor has been uh, around since 1919. 1919, oh, the wow. people of Kansas City came together, raised two and a half million dollars, which is about 35 million dollars today, in 10 days, to create a monument uh, to those who served and died in World War One. Wow. Uh, it was uh, groundbreaking. It was the 1921, and uh, all of the Allied commanders were there, including, including Pershing and Foch. Um, and in 1926, the memorial itself was completed and de- was dedicated by uh, President Calvin Coolidge. Um, so we have a, a wonderful museum. We're updating our exhibits as we speak. We're doing a whole gallery refresh. So please go online uh, and check us out. And if you're in Kansas City, uh, you can, uh, please stop by uh, and uh, you know, explore that the history of World War One and how its enduring impact on our world today. Well, I'll make sure to add those links to the show notes for this episode as well. Thank, Thank you, you again so much for your time, Christopher. My pleasure. Thank you. This episode of Based on a True Story was produced by me, Dan LeFebvre. I'd like to thank Dr. Christopher Warren from the National World War I Museum and Memorial once again for sharing his knowledge about the true story behind All Quiet on the Western Front. If you want to learn more about what really happened in the war, I would highly recommend you go check out the World War I Museum and Memorial. You can start online at theworldwar.org. There you can learn a ton of great information about the war, as well as plan your own trip 
to actually visit the museum and memorial. As always, I've got a link to that in the show notes for this episode, but if you're driving or not able to get there now, those links are always available on the show's home on the web based on a true story podcast.com. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. And as a quick refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, there were multiple lines of trenches. Number two, chemical weapons were only used by the Germans during World War I. Number three, General Friedrichs did not order an offensive attack right at the end like we see in the movie. Did you catch which one is a lie? Let's start with number one. There were multiple lines of trenches. That is true. As we learned from Christopher, there were frontline trenches, reserve trenches, communication trenches. So it's not like there was just one trench running along the front. Next up is number two. Chemical weapons were only used by the Germans during World War I. That's the lie. Chemical weapons were used by everybody on all sides, including the Americans when they joined the war. That means number three is also true. General Friedrichs did not order an offensive attack right at the end like we see in the movie. The reason that's true is that he didn't order an offensive attack is because, well, General Friedrichs was not a real person. So of course he couldn't have ordered an offensive attack. With that said though, as Christopher told us, the concept that we see in the movie of fighting continuing after the armistice was signed and before it went into effect on the 11th hour, the 11th day of the 11th month, that is something that happened on all sides. And it was not just the Germans. Thousands of men were killed in the hours between signing the armistice and it going into effect. Now, if you've made it this far, I'll give you a little sneak peek that next week, We'll get to hear from the team over at Daily History about the World War I armistice. I thought that would be fitting to dig into that a little bit more on its own since we just learned about how it was portrayed in the movie, All Quiet on the Western Front. If you found today's episode entertaining, if you find value in what you're listening to, if you like what I do and you'd like to give back, you can do that over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. Once again, that's based on a true story podcast.com slash support. Until next time, thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon.